Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. It's good to see everybody here this morning. It is really good to see y'all here this morning. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We've had a busy week, haven't we? I know that. God knows that. God knows that we've had a busy week, and, and some of us have had some really strange moments. I, I believe that the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning that some of us have been through some struggles this past week. I believe that the Holy Spirit has been with you, though, the whole time through it. Even though you've been struggling and you've been going through, and, and, and it's the Christmas season. It's the time of rejoicing and just praising and remembering the Son of God. Remembering Jesus and what he came to do. You know, this morning, I know sometime this month, we're going to sing joy to the world. You know that? That's what God wants. God wants to bring joy to the world. And the enemy is constantly trying to block that. But this morning, if you will just, just with us, the worship team, and for, for, to give God glory, to give him glory, to give the devil a, a good old black eye, and tell him that he's not going to ruin your joy. He's not going to ruin your day, and he's not going to ruin the season for what the reason of why we come to the house of God. Amen. We come to the house of God to lift up the name of Jesus. We come to the house of God that we may know God the Father even greater than we already do. Amen. And God the Father is just right now. He, he, he's got a big smile on his face. Picture that with me. Now which parent wouldn't have that? When you look at your children, as much as I'm looking even at these young ones up here in the front, they all got a smile on their face and no worries in the world. Why? Because they trust their mama and their daddy. Put your trust in God this morning. Put your trust in Christ that lives in you this morning. And put your trust that the Holy Spirit, the one that is here with us, to empower us. Amen? Amen. To give us that breakthrough that we need so that we can stand up, stand up for God and have the joy of the Lord in our hearts and give him the hymns and the praises that he deserves. Come on, let's stand up and let's just praise the Lord this morning. Amen. Come on, everybody. Come on, one more time. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, it's awesome to be in this season that we're in, in the, um, it may not be literal, but figurative and the representative of Christ's birth. But, you know, we think back to Passover and how they talked about this Passover lamb with no blemish. And we realize that it's not all about Christmas lights and gifts and, and these people that come down our chimney and eat our cookies and so on. But, you know, it, it's about our Savior, and he was born to die. So what more amazing grace could we celebrate? and be thankful for. So this morning, let's celebrate God's amazing grace, all right? This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? 
whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king of all the kings yeah. who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless and all in wonder the king of glory the king of all the kings yeah this is amazing
lift them up, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Mm, thank you. Let's lift up his name right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. sacrifice like Misty had mentioned before we started worship that he was born to die and how we can be like that sacrifice all to Jesus I surrender all to you I freely give I will ever love and trust you in your presence I will live hmm, thank you thank you Jesus you may be seated at this time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He was born so he could die. What sacrifices? You know, in that chorus that we sung, all to Jesus, I surrender. To be born to die to surrender absolutely everything. That's where we need to take off our selfishness, our image, and surrender everything to our Heavenly Father, Jesus. Surrendering it, regardless how it makes you look in front of other people. Surrendering yourself so regardless of what rung it puts you on a social ladder, but to freely surrender to love and trust in your presence I will live that is just an amazing sacrifice and it's a sacrifice of time it's a sacrifice of finances and it truly is a love offering to be able to do that surrender and to put everything aside thank you Lord thank you Jesus Mm. Thank you, Lord. At this moment, we are going to have our joyful givers assist us in uh, collecting our tithes and offering this morning. If you're new here, if you haven't been here, if you have uh, an offering, just hold that up. And we got some runners, and they will gladly and joyfully take your offering and just bring a smile to everyone's face. Look at this. So many people smiling just to to give this is just amazing now while this is happening i'd like just to do a make a just a couple announcements if you didn't have an opportunity for the painting class that is tonight it's going to be at five o'clock it's 35 dollars uh, for the class if i can get some strapping uh, young men like myself to help me move some chairs after service that would be wonderful also very important last week we made an announcement that the men's breakfast was going to be on the first Saturday of January it's been moved to the 8th at 9 a.m. and that's going to be at the Linda Christian Church and also coming up uh, we have New Year's Eve Wait, hold on let me back up one second this Friday the 17th um, the city is hosting like a Santa Claus around the neighborhood thing um, um, with the fire trucks and stuff like that. And I've been on the phone with the city. I went down to the city on Thursday. I've emailed the city. I'm trying to get a response from the city to say if we can sit in. Luckily, while we had our fire inspection this week, I talked to their battalion chief and he's like, I don't see any problem with it. I'm like, well, that's good, but we still need to make sure that the city is gonna be okay with us participating we just we don't want to take anything away from anyone other than we just want to show the love of Jesus and just be a smile be it be a cheerful uh, song as we follow and carol and throw out you know candy canes and and just be there for our community because community is important because we're all this community amen all right so that's supposed to happen this uh, Friday 
I'll have to reach out to everybody to find out when we're going to meet up because I don't even know when they're starting their neighborhood uh, route, but we want to be a available. I'll get that to you as soon as we can. Um, the last bit is New Year's Eve. We're going to have a watch party. And so we're going to show up here at about 930-ish in the evening. And we're going to have uh, we're going to have some worship. We're going to have the word, a message. We're going to have a candlelight service. We're going to have snacks and stuff like that. And we have some leftover fireworks from this year. We always kind of try to hold just a little aside. That way we can uh, just have a little celebration of the new year um, out in the parking lot if you're able to make it that late. I tell you what, we had a late night this late night this weekend. Freddie, you want to talk to that at all? If you don't know, this is Pastor Freddie. Hold on. Just something to be happy for is like our group, our youth groups, a really standout group. And I'm just gonna say that again. Even at camp, like they were like. You know, like other youth groups and, and youth pastors would be like, you guys got an amazing group, you know. And I just want to let you guys know that, again, um, the district, uh, well, Chris Jacobson, I don't know if he's a, he's not the, the DYD, he's like the assistant, what is he? Presbyter, I uh, know, the, the son. Well, he go, he's he's well-known youth pastor, and he gets up there, and he once again just said, you know what, Freddie, I just want to say your youth group, man, you guys are amazing. Like, you you got something special going on. I was over there watching you guys, and every one of you guys, every one of your youth had their hands raised and they were worshiping and you could just see our youth group just set apart from the other youth groups. You know, I'm not trying to, trying to say, talk bad on the other, but you could just see that, the, that our youth group was, was really trying to find, God, trying to get a better, closer relationship with God. And then I just want, I just, that says a lot about, you know, the parents and says a lot about our church, you know, it speaks volumes when, when the youth are actually, when you could see a difference in our youth than the other youth groups. And I want to say there was probably a good 10, 15 youth groups and, and our youth group stood out by far. And I think we should have a recount because we should have taken that belt home. But you know what? That just means we got to be more diligent. That means we got to be out in the community, getting our kids a part of this. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful because, you know, those kids don't just go out there and raise hands and get in worship and praise with other kids if it wasn't for one person doing this. You know, let's give it up to uh, Pastor Freddy for what he's doing with the youth. You know, there's a lot of help that can happen uh, with youth. If you want to help on a Thursday evening, I try to come and help with the music and the slides. That way he can just focus on the message and what he's doing. But if you want to help out, you know, we'll never turn down turn down a hand so God is just doing some things um, if you were part of last week's baptism can you stand up so Pastor Larry has some certificates for those who uh, were baptized if you want to come up and uh, receive your certificate pastor had um, he's already signed them but he didn't know who was going to be here today so just have you uh, write your name in there or have your mom write your name in there? We had some young people being baptized. All right, kids, after this, you guys are free to go with uh, Sister Mercedes back to Children's Church. Let's hear it for Sister Mercedes, setting the foundation uh, for the kingdom. Amen, amen. And you can give those $20 to Pastor after the service for those certificates. But before that, let's get back on our feet and let's just uh, get back into worship because uh, he is worthy of it. And uh, I love worshiping my God. Mm. Amen. Amen. Pastor, if you'd like to join us in your more than welcome. Oh, wait. Yeah, you. If you'd like to join us, you're more than welcome. <laughs>
There's a power in worship. And I feel often that it can be taken two different ways. It can be songs that you love, that are entertaining, that are beautiful, and you can sing this song and you can pour out your voice and your heart. But you know what? There's also this thing in worship called this is a way for me to touch the heart of God and a, me, a way for me to remind myself why I worship this God that's been so merciful and graceful to me. Two completely different things. So when we're singing and when we're worshiping, when these songs come up, they're not a prompt for you to sing the next word and know what's going to be coming out of your mouth and how to form your phrases. It's not that. It's a way to con congregationally join together to go further to the heart of God to exalt our Lord. 
whether there was music, no music, whether the singing was beautiful, whether the singing was a little less than that, is not the point. So when we're singing these songs, absorb everything within there. Um, the songs, and over and over, I've been fascinated whenever we sing something about the hands of God. Many people have memories and, and can equate certain things to, to another. And sometimes I remember um, when I was growing up, we were driving down on the highway over by, um, over by where Esteban's is now. And um, on the highway, I flew out of the car and um, happened to land just so perfectly in a huge pile of glass. And I was afraid to move. And it was just, you know, you're in shock. And I remember my grandpa stopped the car in the middle of the road. And I wasn't little at this time. I mean, oh, I've never been that little. But I, I was, you know, in his hands. That's what I remember was his hands coming to pick me up. So the hands that pick us up are the hands that created the universe. So don't let these words and these songs be in vain from your mouth. Use them as an illustration, as a tool, as a gift to go closer to and to reach the heart of God.
another time through, but I want you to go share this blessing, speak this blessing over your neighbor right there. We're going to share this blessing with each other. We're going to lift each other up. We're not going to leave this house without speaking this blessing over another person. Release that blessing. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor. your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you for a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family your children and their children and your children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children and your children and your going and your behind you and beside you all around you and within you the present and the going and behind you and beside you around you he is with you he is with you He is 
Rejoice in where he made a way, church. Rejoice in that. When you're going through something and you stop because you think that there's no way through, he's already made a way. You just got to go. He's for you. He's for you. God says something, he's going to do it. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless your family this morning. Aren't you, aren't you glad you can come to a place where the Spirit shows up? If you're new to this, hang around. You haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Praise God. God is so good to us today. So good to us. Hallelujah. 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 
as some of you may know and some of you may not, we lost our son-in-law, 31 years old, to cancer, four days before Thanksgiving. And uh, we had his funeral service Friday. And uh, for you that knew that was praying, thank you. And so this song is quite uh, encouraging that we, we believe God is going to take care of our family. Amen. Hallelujah. God didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. God didn't pick us up to let us down. We're going to go through some trials and troubles, but we're going to come out of the fire purified, pure as gold. And if not in this life, then in the life to come. Amen. That's why Jesus came, to give us life eternal. In preparation for this message, the Lord began to speak to me about it Monday when I was here in prayer. And all through the week, the Lord began to speak to me about it. And I'm glad that he did because uh, we've had some trials this week. My biggest trial was the guy that was pushing his girlfriend around the other day, and I wanted to whip him so bad. You'd probably been visiting your pastor in the county jail because nobody pushes a woman around, not in my book. Guys, you can treat it the way you want, but you let somebody touch my wife, I'm going to be all over you. You may whip me, but you're going to know you've been in a fight. <laughs> now, Jesus said, if you, you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Well, some days I feel like living by it. Between that and funeral services and family contention, we've had what I'm going to preach today. The Lord told Brother David Wilkerson one time before he passed, he said, I don't want you to practice what you preach. I want you to learn to preach what you've practiced. People need somebody that's genuine to let them know. That's why Jesus came, because where you're at, he's been there. He has been through everything that you and I could ever pass through, every valley, every mountain, every trial, every need, every care. He was acquainted with grief and sorrow, the Bible tells us in, the, in Isaiah chapter 53. He, the Bible says he was in all points tempted like as we are, Pastor, yet without sin. That's why we can go to him, because he's been there. If you don't think he didn't feel like whipping up on a few folks every now and then, you need to go back to the book. I'm just simply saying, it's been a trying week, so I've got the right message. The Lord appointed it to me in my heart, and I know this, so I've been praying about this. And, and I thank Sister Janet for praying with us on the phone the other day. Otherwise, somebody was going to get hurt that afternoon. I'm not the scrawniest guy, so I give them all I got. Praise God. Why do you think I carry around poles when I'm painting? <laughs> Sometimes I have to have an equalizer anyway. I know that may not fit as a pastor, but listen, I will take care of my family any way that I can. That's how I believe it. I like the guy that had the sign pointing to his neighbor said, he doesn't believe in guns. You can take what's in his house. <laughs> he, his neighbor took him to court and judge says he can put whatever he wants in his yard. <laughs> you do what you want to do, but it's been a trying week. But I'm standing here today with victory in my heart. Can I hear an amen? Because <laughs> we serve an awesome God today. Life just has a way of showing you how human you can really be sometimes. And we, we sometimes it seems like that the, the, uh, the, the fleshly man uh, wants to try to take over. But we've got to keep him to the cross. And if he wins the day, we take him back to the cross. Amen. Amen. There's a song that I've been, I haven't heard in quite some time. And and it come to my mind while I was praying about this message. And as you, if you've been online, our, um, our uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook page, you can, uh, we usually post our messages beforehand. And I'm thankful to the Lord that he allows us to do it. Sister Misty's able to put all that up. But uh, the title of the message today is, What's Going On, God? And if you want to, you can turn to Genesis uh, chapter 22. We're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to talk a little bit about it. I'm... Um, but I want to sing this song, if I can do that, before we uh, minister the word today. A and I, I got to say, everybody that's doing ministry, what a blessing. What a great blessing. I'm expecting this place to fill up continually. I'm expecting God to continue to, you know, just grace us with his presence like he has this morning. I, I, I just thank God for the song. I thank God that I can trust him with everything in my life. I can trust him 
when I'm in death and I can trust him when I'm in bad health. Can I hear an amen? So today we're going to talk about a little bit about learning how to trust God and the value of trusting God. I mean, who else are you going to go to? <laughs> well, I guess we got a lot of options, but I, I, I kind of feel like the way that it should be is we run to him first and foremost. So I want to sing this song and I hope it'll be a blessing. It's going to take you back a few years, uh, which my songs usually do. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm only 40, so don't worry about it, but... <laughs> We, we've had, let me see the hands of those who had birthdays in December. I know we got Pastor Warren. But yeah, look at that. Happy birthday. Can you say happy birthday to everybody? Amen. Before I minister this word, though, I'm glad to have my good, my good pastor friend, Pastor Wayne Warren. Great man, loves God. Pastor, would you stand for just a minute and greet our family today, please? Yes, he is. That's exactly what she told me in God. That devotional spoke to me this morning. Yes. After her. God knows how to speak. Come on. And, and uh, I'm so glad God speaks when pastor was talking about the church and I was praying with him about him coming I'm so glad that God spoke to this congregation you got a great man of God he loves God he cherishes God we've been friends for a long time and pastor I want to thank you for your godly friendship you and your wife and I'm just glad to be here this morning and I'm just I tell you what that worship was phenomenal yes it is amen thank Thank you Lord. Lord Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. This song is called God Will Make a God Will Make This Trial a Blessing. I just come into a valley, one like I've never seen before. I keep searching for a way out Seems like padlocks on the door Oh, there must be another sunrise Another sunset that I'll see God will make this trial a blessing That's the love He has for me brings me to my knees though my tears flow like a river yet in him there's sweet relief oh there's no need to get discouraged no need to talk defeat God will make this tribe a blessing and the whole wide world will see I was not the You see, every child of God, this test that you must face, it is here that God will mold you, make you what you ought to be. God will make this trial a blessing, just be patiently and see. You know you can help me. Remind us today that trials don't last forever. Now I'm standing on a mountain. I'm looking back and I can see. When I was in my lowest valley, his strong hand was guiding me. Oh, 
it's good to see the sunshine and to taste sweet victory. God has made this tribe a blessing for the grace he gives to me. God will make this tribe a blessing, though it brings me to my knees, though my tears flow like a river, oh, and here there's sweet release, oh, there must be another sunrise, another sunset that I'll see. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me if you don't mind just briefly? I'm going to share a passage of scripture we want to go to in Genesis chapter 22. I hope it will, this message will just encourage us today and remind us that we are not alone in our endeavors and walks with God. Never, 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 never. I want to read it. I've got it written down here, but I want to read it from the Word itself. I don't mind. I appreciate my pad. I'm very thankful because you know I can't read my own writing. Let's read one verse together in Genesis chapter 22. I believe it is up on the screen. We're going to start <clears throat> chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. Let's say tempt. You say God doesn't tempt anybody. Huh. We're about to find out. God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Lord, thank you today. Thank you, Spirit of God, for your presence, Lord. I want to hide behind you. I want to sit at your feet, wait upon you, and share what you want us to hear today, Holy Spirit. We pray, continue, Lord, in the Word today to build our faith. Bless our teachers and our classes and our students and our churches, the congregation of God, the family of God in Live Oak tonight in our communities in these surrounding areas. We ask your favor and your blessings today. Sanctify holy this vessel, God, for your honor and your use. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. Let me read just a little bit if I can. And most of us are familiar with Abraham, and I don't want to spend much time talking about him in particular, but really this is, this is about everything in the Bible, and this is my opinion, is not necessarily about the individual that it's been written about, but it's about what God does with those individuals. It's what God does for those individuals, and it's what God does through those individuals. And so you look at a scripture, and you, you look at it, or you look at a story that you're reading. If you're an avid Bible reader, then, then you're going to come across a lot of people. book of Genesis is primarily about seven different individuals, seven individual men from Adam all the way up to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so and so forth. And but Abraham's life is an amazing life. He has his ups and downs. He's recorded all through scriptures. He's in the book of Romans. He's in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is a part of the faith. Uh, heroes, we might call them. But Abraham has had quite a life up to this point here in chapter 22. And I believe we find Abraham in somewhere in chapter 11 or 12, and we begin to read about him there. So let me just go back briefly, if I can, real quick, just for a moment. Up to this point, Abraham's life, Later called, he's later called, referred to as the father of faith. And he is around 400 years, if you need, if you like history, 400 years before the law that was given from, from God down to Moses on Mount Sinai. And then about from Abraham to Christ is around 4,000 years. From Christ to our time now is around 2,000 years. And how many know that on the seventh day God rested? Hello. Did you just now put that together? 4,002 makes six, and then you got the seventh coming up. We're getting ready to find, we're getting ready to enter into the seventh year. One day with the Lord, Peter said, is as a thousand years. Are we close to the return of Christ? Yes, we are. Can I hear an amen again? We are close. Seven thousand. Jesus, the Bible says God rested on the seventh day, so we're getting close to that day of rest. And I believe we're getting ready to go home. But we're still here. Someone asked me, and I told you before, why? how do you know the rapture hasn't taken place? Well, hello, I'm still here. 
You say, that's kind of arrogant. No, it's not. I just have faith in what God said. He said, if you believe me, I'm the resurrection and the life. Come on. He that believes me shall never see death. He shall live. Praise God. Later called the father of faith, Abraham has received several instructions and promises up to this point from God. First, he has been instructed to leave his father's family and head toward the land of Canaan, which he does. God promises him an amazing future in using him to build the foundation lineage for the son of David, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world and the nation of Israel. Abraham witnesses the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, wins a battle to save his nephew Lot from an enemy, is delivered from kings because of poor choices, entertains angels who give promise to the birth of his son, Isaac through his aged, old, his <laughs> aged wife, <laughs> Sarah, at the ripe old age of 90. How many of you ladies can appreciate wanting to have a child at 90 years old? Do not raise your hand. And Abraham at the age of 99. I thought when we adopted Marcus and Cassidy, I was almost 36. I thought, man, I'm too old until I started reading the Bible. I said, I'm not even getting started. But that's Abraham. I'm not Abraham. Who would later, who would not proclaim, who would later proclaim uh, what a mighty God that he did serve. Now fast forward 12 to 13 years, and you know the story that Abraham took Hagar, one of the handmaidens, uh, that was given to him from Sarah, and because uh, she at that time could not conceive a child. When, Abra when Isaac was born, God had gave the promise to Abraham 25 years later. Uh, and so you fast forward to uh, 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 Hagar, the handmaiden, they, and, and I just, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they kind of got ahead of God here. And he winds up with a son through Hagar, and it's called Ishmael, which is where you get the, the uh, Arab nations, and we know the results of all that so far. And so that never turned out well. Hagar was sent on her way, and Ishmael went, and they were gone. And God told Hagar, I'll make a great nation out of him. And you have the Edomites, and they became a great nation. And, and, and so Isaac stayed. So now you fast forward. After Abraham's had this child at around 99 years old, at 12 to 13 years later, after the birth of Isaac, God speaks to Abraham and tells him and instructs him that I want you to take your son, your only son, because remember, Ishmael's gone. Yes, Abraham had other children, but they were not the children that God was pointing to. Listen to me. How many know that when you give your life to Jesus, you really enter into a new covenant with God and you become officially the promised child of God? And so whenever Ish, so here's Isaac and Abraham, and I, I, can, I can imagine, I can only imagine, because obviously we weren't there, what kind of situation it was. I'm sure that there were many a journeys, many a times when Isaac went out to help tend sheep, to help tend uh, uh, flocks and, and check on, uh, uh, you know, herds and check on servants and check on families and, and all these things. And I imagine his son, Pastor, probably stayed right close next to him. So in this connection, one day Abraham gets up and he hears God speak to him in his heart and in his life. And he says, Abraham, I want you. The reason I bring the age up now is because Isaac is not a two-year-old child. He's not a six-year-old child. He's not a ten-year-old. He is a preteen. Hello. Up to this point. And you can imagine the times that him and his, his father, Abraham, journeyed together and they walked the wilderness and, and all the wonderful places they'd been, the wonderful adventures at this point that him and his son had been. I mean, he was the son of his old age. And then one day Abraham gets up. God speaks to him and says, I want you to take your son, your only son. And he speaks to him. He says, Abraham, he says, here am I, and let's continue the story here. Now fast forward 12 or 13 years later after the birth of Isaac where we begin our message in Genesis 22, 1 through 14. And it came to pass after these things, the things I had just shared with you, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Now I want to, ref I want to just for a moment, if I can, to define the word tempt. Because when we read the word temptation, it has several different meanings in Scripture depending on its context and its connotation. In this particular passage here, the word tempt, the Hebrew word, means to test thoroughly. Now I want to remind us, if I can, first of all, that God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot be tempted with sin, and God never tempts any man with sin or evil. The devil may have made you do it, but God didn't. Matter of fact, the devil didn't either. Am I in the right church? We still have freedom of choice. 
James chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, blessed is the man that endureth. Can you say endureth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that. That endureth temptation. This is different than the word tempt. For when he is tried, the Bible said, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted of God, for God, that he's, when he's tempted, that he's tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So Abraham's temptation or his test was not an attempt to cause Abraham to place himself in a position where he was dealing with a sin issue. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is simply a trial. If you take a bag of garbage that weighs 25 pounds, some of you need to take your garbage out a little sooner than that. Hello! Just thought I'd throw that in there. That if you ask your four-year-old son to take it out, he has a hard time getting it out. He may get it out of the bag, knock half of it in the floor, and drag the other half outside. What have you done? You've attempted him to accomplish something that there's a good chance that he cannot accomplish without your assistance. I need to let you know this today. Whether you're going through a test or whether you're going through a temptation, that God is enabling you and I to be able to carry everything that he places in front of us. You know why? Because he's there to help carry carry that so he to Abraham's test was designed to allow God here it goes now and this is why I titled this message what in the what is going on God what is going on here why would God tempt a man to take his only son when God and Abraham both knew that human sacrifice was an abomination and a violation to the laws of God this is why church abortion is a violation and abomination to the kingdom of God because everything about it breeds wrong and murder and darkness. Can I hear an amen, church? Can the church stand up and say amen anymore? So God speaks to Abraham and says, hey, he says, here am I. Hey, is, is, is Larry Brefford interpretation. He says, here am I. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son, why did God do this? Because God is getting ready to take Abraham to a whole new level of trust. Can you say trust? The test was not put in place to take away. Now, I'm going to allow you and let you, because I cannot do that, to tell you what your test may be or define your test. But I will say this today, that tests come and they're allowed by God never to break us down unless we need broken down. Hello. But they are designed to build us up and allow us a new revelation of the power and the presence and the authority of God. If God did not put in us the human value of thirst and hunger and affection and companionship, we would never know the joy and the value of his suppli supplements. Can I hear an amen? Come on, somebody help me. In this process here, you say, but I don't want any tests. I can't help you there. Because <laughs> if you've given your life to the Lord for, 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 for any length of time, there is going to be tests. <laughs> tests are, I hated tests in school. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I studied several years for the, 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 my master's and bachelor's degree that I have in biblical counseling, I want you to know I was proud to say that I got an A on every single test. That's because it was open book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, had it not been open book. I, I mean, I was up for hours and hours and hours studying midterms and, and, you know, identifying. They give you a sheet about that big with all the cities, 40, 50, 60 cities of the ancient Mediterranean days of the travels of Abraham and Moses and, and, where, my, and where Paul went on his first and second journeys. And, and I had to fill in by memory all those. And so I spent hours and hours and hours when the test came in. But when I got the results, can I hear an amen? And I got that big OA at the top. I want you to know that I was proud. Hallelujah. I was proud the test was over. That's what I was proud of. So God puts Abraham to the test. Now remember this. This test means to thoroughly, 
thoroughly, let me read it again, to thoroughly, test thoroughly. So he's in a test. So this test here was a test of Abraham's obedience to God, and this test was more about what God wanted to show Abraham more than what Abraham was able to show God. Remember that. When you're in a test, it's about God's results at the end, showing what He wants to do, what He can give, what He can impart to you and me. Can you say amen? <laughs> Abraham, God knew what the results of Abraham's faith would lead to. And he knows the same for his children here in the 21st century. When God puts us through a test or allows trials, his divine objection is to build on the faith we already have in and through Jesus Christ. Did not Jesus say in the scriptures in the book of Luke that when he returns here to this earth, will he find any faith on earth? If there's one thing the devil would like to take from you beside your homes, your children, your inheritance, your families, your relationships, he'd like to take your faith away from you because children of God without faith, it's impossible to please God. For when we come to God, we must believe that he is, hallelujah, and that he is a rewarder of those that did let you seek him aren't you glad God gives us faith to believe and trust in him hallelujah it's his faith in my life and trust in God that's brought us through our difficult days oh we've got more ahead but the same yesterday is today he is tomorrow <laughs> we need trials whether we welcome them or not, as a constant reminder that we as children of God can always trust our Heavenly Father. Listen to Peter regarding tests and trials in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a, can you say, lively hope. Lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. <laughs> Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise. Watch the end result of the test. Here's the end result of the test. That we would have a higher level of praise for God. We would have a higher level of honor for God. We would have a higher level and a deeper depth of honor and glory for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, let the world celebrate Christmas with all the mess that they want to celebrate. But I'm going to celebrate this year because he's my king today. Hallelujah. He's my God. He's my creator. He's my redeemer. He's my sanctifier. Fire. He's my healer. He's my blesser. He's my keeper. He's my salvation. He's my life. He's my hope. He's my resurrection. He's my glory. He's my honor. He's my blessings today. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm like, Maybe you're like me. You shouldn't be sometimes, but you might be. You pull out your phone, you get, a, you get some kind of alert. You pull it up and says, you got some kind of alert and so and so forth. You know what you usually do? <laughs> don't, don't, get so, don't get too holy on me now. I know what you do. You reach down and push that button out the bottom or the left. You stuff it back in your pocket, and you don't pay no mind to the warning. Sometimes a test comes our way. Because, hello, it's coming up, Pastor, as a warning. Something's on the way. You feel like you need to get up a little earlier. Somebody help me preach. You get up at 6, and you got to get up at 4 or 5 or 6. You just feel something stirring inside to get up. You've been given an alarm on your phone, on your spiritual identity of the connection that you have because you got a hotline to heaven. Come on, somebody help me. Anybody here got a hotline to God? Can anybody get a prayer through here today? Does anybody have any faith to believe God for the impossible? 
test will help build that trust in God that gives us that ability to believe him for what we don't see, trust him for what we can't control, give up what we can't handle, and live in peace. I don't know about you, but I don't like my world shaking too often. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That we might be found under praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom he not not seen, ye love. Whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> you say, how does that work? It worked that way 25 minutes ago. When we were in the presence <laughs> of the spirit of a living God. We were in the presence of the Spirit, Pastor, and all of a sudden all those issues that I worried about left. Come on, somebody help me. Those situations, how am I going to handle it? They're gone. How am I going to deal with this? It goes away. Because why? Because he's perfecting that in me. And what he, is, he is perfecting that, that, that. He's allowing that test to bring me into a higher level of maturity to know that God, when my faith makes connection with his spirit, he, I can look up at him and say, Abba, Father, hallelujah. I don't know how it's going to work out. This test is driving me crazy. I don't know how I'm going to deal with my kids. My husband's about to lose it. He's already lost it. I thought, yeah, yeah, I thought I, I just picked on the guys today. Take it, guys. Come on. All of a sudden, in the presence, that test is placed in an area where it's like God is saying, I got this. Pastor, that's why we need the Holy Spirit to show up every time we come together. We have to have him. Woo! Because he's the lifter of my burdens. He, he's, he's the sanctifier when I got unholy thoughts. Can I hear an amen? He's the one that rushes in when the devil goes inside and tries to mess with my mind about things that don't make no sense, Pastor. All of a sudden, the Bible says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard uh, against him. Uh, I'm telling you, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, the Lamb of God, uh, the King of glory. And he's all that I ever need. And when I'm in my test, and he shows up, it doesn't always eliminate the test. Matter of fact, be very careful about begging God to get you out of it. Let me let you in on a secret. From my personal experience, if the Spirit moves me away from that particular test, whether it's spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, financial, or psychological, and he moves me away from that, and he has every right to do that, then it seems like there's a matter of time before he brings me back into it again. You ever looked around and said, hmm, deja vu. I did, you didn't know I speak French, did you? To all my French brothers and sisters, wee oui, wee. Oui. Yeah. I got to go on. I, I, just, I just got more. I told you, when I told Sister Ann, I'm at, I'm at page five. She goes, huh. So I, so I had to quit. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Family of God, let me say this. This thought just comes to me as I read this scripture. I want God to squeeze and extract from me while I am still here, every ounce of faith that he can extract from that relationship that he's blessed me by saving my, my empty, dark, dying, dead soul, that all that element and that ounce of faith can be extracted, come on, I'm about to say it, can be extracted out of me so that it, it, it just promotes the kingdom of God. And, it, and it, when, that when, when the Lord takes me home, I will re be received into his presence with glory and honor and praise. I, 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 am never, I am not worried. I am not, I'm not concerned about what I've done in my past and the Lord has forgiven me. I get concerned about what I could do that I haven't done yet. 
I want God. You see, God can't use us until you're dead to yourself. Not the way He wants to. He doesn't want 90% of us. He wants all of us. And you're going to ask the question. I'm glad you just thought of it. How do you know when God has more than all 90%? He has 100%. Is when you don't bail on Him in the middle of a test. Anybody can eat a dish of ice cream when it tastes good. I've never had a dish I didn't like. I can only say that. My point is this. When things are not going as well as you would assume or believe or think that they could go, that's where the rubber meets the road. Why do you think Sister Anna and I are here? You say, we voted you in. We appreciate that. But we could have said no. Been there, done that. But we had faith. Did God say, well, you're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey? No. How about walnuts and peaches? Pastor, I'm good with that. Persimmons? Kiwi? Yeah. Milk upsets my stomach, and I don't need a lot of honey. So what do I need it for? What are you talking about? What I'm saying is, but he didn't say there wouldn't be tests. But he said, I'm going to bless this congregation. I'm going to grow this community. I'm going to bless your children. You're going to see families come in here you thought would never come back to God. He's going to reach out and save the backslider. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to bless your family and my family. Can I hear an amen? We're going to put our faith together and we'll walk with our tests together as brothers and sisters hallelujah tests will bring us together you have a train wreck downtown and i hear about it i'm going to be in my car and i'm going over there to help somebody i'm not going to start throwing stones and try to blame somebody i'm going to say my god put me to work this is what faith does in the middle of a test it says god where are you and faith says god i know you're there even when you don't hear it or see it. Some here today are going through some very, very, very trying times. But God is with you to help build and grow thy faith. And be careful. I'm just talking from experience. I'm not satisfied with us four no more. I never have been. I'm not talking about attendance here. I'm talking about reaching this entire city for God. I don't know that there's hardly anybody maybe that hasn't heard about Jesus. But apparently everybody hasn't heard him enough. Because, Pastor, we're still here. And we're still reaching out. And we're still loving and still blessing. Can I hear an amen? Still trying to reach people for God. That's what faith does. He said now in, verse, in chapter 22, verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son. Are you still with me? Genesis 22. I'm going to close here in about 45, 50, 60, 70, 80 minutes. I just want you to pick one. (laughs) Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. In Mount Moriah is a place King David offers sacrifice to God for the healing of the people from a plague because of his disobedience of numbering the people of Israel. 2 Samuel 24, 25. Mount Moriah is a place where Solomon built the first temple. 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1. And after the destruction of the temple by Solomon by the Babylonians in around 538 A.D.C., Herod added to the temple, which was built by Ezra's day, when 50,000 Jews are released by Cyrus king of the Persia and they went back according to Ezra chapter 1 and they went back and they began to rebuild a temple and they lay the foundation was still there everything else was wiped out and they began to build it again before it fast forward several hundred hundred thousand years later not a hundred thousand a couple thousand years later you find that Jesus
Jesus is walking among the disciples, and they looked at him and said, look at this temple. That temple it took King Herod 40 and two years to build. That was the same temple that they rebuilt in Ezra's day, hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the coming of Christ. Uh, but Jesus, that on that temple that Herod had built, the same place where the second temple, the first temple built by Solomon and the people, the Jews that came back from captivity built, that is the same temple called Moriah and Mount Moriah, and that's the same temple where Herod built his temple. And let me let you in a little bit more information. Today, the, uh, the uh, Islamic mosque is exactly where that temple is believed to have been built. But according to the scripture, Zechariah chapter 13 and 14, there's going to be another day when they're going to reenact and reactivate all the, all the animal sacrifices and, because that's the temple. They believe it to be up on that temple in, in, in where the mosque is built today. If that is biblically true, some scholars say, no, it's further this way. Some say it's further this way. Then the next battle, let me say this, the next battle that you may hear of may be the destroyer of the destruction. And of course, Luke chapter 24 was the fulfillment of the prophecy of this temple being built where it is today by the Gentiles. Jesus made that statement. Uh, and but we have, But don't be surprised if in the coming days that begins the war that you see in Ezekiel 37 and 38 that the, the uh, I, I, Iranians don't come in and try to level that temple because of that's where Solomon's temple pastor was built. That's where the next temple is going to be built where the Antichrist is going to come in and he's going to sit and he's going to rule and reign. We're in that day now. And it wouldn't surprise me if that temple was blown to bits because if that's where it's supposed to be built, what God says, that's where it's going to be built. So Mount Moriah has significance. You still with me? That was just a side note. I know, but you need to know the value of Moriah. He said, and offer him, therefore, a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I would tell thee of. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham <laughs> said <coughs> to the young men, verse 5, Abide ye here with the young men, abide ye here with the asses, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide. Can you say amen? God will provide. Somebody needs to hear a word right now from the Lord. In the midst of your test, in the midst of your trying time, you're going to hear something from God. You're going to get a word behind you, and that word is going to say, go this way. Go this way. Do this. Say this. Live like this. Lead this. Walk this way. You're going to hear that from God because in the midst of the test, in the middle of a test, God always makes provision. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Verse 9, and they came to the place which God, <laughs> I like this. which God built an altar there, uh, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Mm. Huh. Huh. And he said, an angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, I tell you what, it pays to hear the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah. You say, how can I learn to hear the voice of the Lord? You'll hear him probably more in your trials than you were in your resting time. Let me say this. I believe the Lord would have me to tell you this. You hear him when you need to. You hear him when you need to. Abraham called the well, let me finish. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad. 
neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from, him, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, and looked behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took, I, I can only imagine, Pastor, how happy Abraham felt. But if you know anything about Abraham's faith in God, if you read Romans chapter, I believe it's, I'm not sure, I think it's chapter 4, you'll find out that it gives revelation to why Abraham went ahead and obeyed God because God had already given the promise through, through his son Isaac would come the promise inheritance would come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on and so forth. And you see the evidence of that promise in, in Israel today and all across America. They're the Jewish people. Can I hear an amen? And God, the writer tells us that Abraham believed God. He believed God so much that he believed that if he had slain his son at that moment, then at that very moment, God would have had to raise him from the dead. Can I hear an amen? Come on, somebody help me today. It's like Raven Hill said one time, if God doesn't judge America for her filthy, filthy immoral sins today that are run rampant from street to street, from nation to nation, to city to city, God will be required to raise Sodom and Gomorrah up and apologize. That's where we're at. But God is putting the church to the test. Maybe that's what two years in a row have been about. Pastor, there's a test on the line. You say, how do I know when I pass the test? It's when you're still laying everything you have on the altar every single day in the hands of God. The altar is the key to the success of a wonderful outcome of your test. Had Abraham heard the call and not answered, I don't know what the results would have been. I don't suspect it would have been favorable. But in one single swift test, God proved Abraham that God was true to his promise. Can I hear an amen? I want you to know when Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Uh, his promises are yea and amen to the glory of God. Uh, when he said, my children are going to be saved, uh, they're going to be saved. Uh, if he says the church is going to make it through the fire, we're going to make it through the fire hallelujah we're gonna go praising God loving God serving God blessing God I'd like to give you some of my tests brother Freddie I wish I could pass some of mine on to somebody else but I couldn't do it if I pass it on that means they get the benefit of it Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh and is said unto this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh has been translated as God my provider but I believe there's something else here that we need to see. At the end of your test you're going to have an altar and you'll need to revisit that altar every now and then and that altar is Jehovah Jireh you know what Jehovah Jireh means in Hebrews? It means God will see to it. Hmm. 1989, 1990, I've shared. I believe that when I was in prayer one night, I'd been in prayer quite some time, and, and the Lord spoke very clear to me and said, I'm going to give you a son. Ann and I were not able to have any more children for a long time. And I thought that was quite interesting. That was good. Aren't you glad God doesn't rebound with our doubt? Hello. Aren't you glad he don't always respond to it? Because he's more. If he commands us that in our faith we find patience, how much more patient is our heavenly father? Now, you may not want to push it around all the time, but I'm just telling you, he makes room for things and stuff. At least he has in our lives. And I remember going back to lay down. Sister Anna asked me, she said, for Jeff, I don't know what reasons. Well, she said, did the Lord say anything to you? Maybe he'd been speaking to her too. But he, I told her, I said, well, I believe the Lord told me he's going to give us a son. The same God that told Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to give you a son. Somebody help me preach today. Is the same God through Jesus Christ is the same one, Celeste, that told me and sister, your aunt, are, you're, what is, are we aunt and uncle? Yes, well, I don't know what we are anymore. That God was going to give us a son. 
And remember I told you he gave, us, he gave us little Cassidy, two months old. And I said, God, you told me a son, not a daughter. He said, I just double blessed you. Well, I'm still working on that. Amen. And you know she's the one who just buried her husband last Friday. She's 27 and she's a widow with two children, seven and four. And I'm telling you what, what a delight and a joy that we have. I'm telling you, my God has fulfilled his promises. Amen. And many times. And when we got back to the States, we, we, we had no, listen to me, when the Lord speaks something to you, you don't, let me just give you some, can I give you a little bit of advice? It might be to your best interest to do one thing, believe God. Believe God. I had no idea how, it would, how this was all going to pan out. But over a period of the next year or two, God worked it out so that we were able to go through adoption processes and we received two children. My God is an awesome God today. Amen. When God told me back in 35 years ago, Pastor Freddie, I was in prayer and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I remember this. I remember today. Why? Because that's one of my Jehovah Jireh altars. Can I hear an amen? That's one of my altars that I get to revisit. That's how you get through your test sometimes. You've got to revisit some altars. How God blessed you. How God brought you through. Am I talking to anybody? When your mind was all upside down, you weren't sure what to do, didn't know what job to go to, what relationship to have, what church to attend, what trouble. You, it, it's just life, Brother Johnny. But I'm telling you, when we start trusting, they that trust in the Lord, the Bible says, shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, the Bible says, and he will direct your path. I take those scriptures to be New Testament rules of faith. Can I hear an amen today again? Praise God. But I just don't want to quote a scripture. I want to see God work it out. He said, okay, if you want to see it work it out, i got to get you in the fire to let it work itself out. Come on, somebody help me. i got to allow you in the lion's den every now and then. I'm just here to tell you today, you're going to go through trials. You're going to be tested. You're faith will be tested, but God is going to bring you through. Try it as gold. You're going to come through with a purity that you didn't have before. Why? You're going to get a new revelation of how good God really is. Our God is good. It's not a song we just sing. I've experienced the goodness of God, as many of you have. So what's going on? God is teaching Abraham you can trust me with your most, pre- your most prized possession. People are going to lose their souls to the devil and to the world for things that are going to perish. And it doesn't have to be. A young man told me one time when I worked at Procter & Gamble, they, I told you they, the, the parents were allowed to have their students come in there and and work part-time during the summer because they were in college. And, and I was able to talk to quite a few students that worked in different universities. One young man that was going to University of Berkeley in his, his pre, pre-stage of, of going to be a doctor. And he asked me one day, he said, Larry, you've talked to me about the things of the Lord. He goes, you, you're telling me i got to give this up and give this up and give this up. I said, hang on a minute, son. Don't get the cart before the horse. Don't. Somebody help me this morning. Don't start telling God what you think you have. Don't, don't bargain with God. Just put it on the altar. Huh, Pastor? Just put it on the altar. Put it, every day that we pastor here, we put you on the altar. And blessing God, trusting God, believing God. And still when things don't go the way that we think they go, still believing and trusting God. Amen? And I told this young man, I said, don't start telling God what you have to give up. That's his job to tell you what you need to give up. Hello? If that's what he did for Abraham, that's what he'll do for us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is Abraham not the father of our faith through the Lord Jesus Christ? Somebody help me. He just give the pre, pre-stage of what Jesus is doing in our life. If the Lord wants to take something, he'd rather you give it up than you have to give it up. In other words, he will give you the ability to lay it down. Went to a young lady. The Lord told me one day at work, he said, go tell her not to marry that guy. Are you kidding me? She'll slap me and knock me down. She'll beat me up. I mean, I'm just thinking all kinds of crazy stuff. That's not my business. Lord, I got got my own yard. Can I hear an amen? I got my own backyard to clean up. But God was using me because she was, listen to me, God will bring others in your test. God will bring others in your test. And they may be people you don't even know, you've never met, you've never seen. 
And I finally got a chance working right next to her. And I leaned over and I said, you know, I know this sounds strange. And you don't know me. And I didn't know who she was. She worked on another team. I looked at her and said, I got to just say this. The Lord told me to tell you not to marry that guy. She just looked at me and stared at me. Well, I walked off fast. I gave the word, Pastor. I didn't, he didn't tell me to hang around. I'm, I'm like the prophet that went to Jehu, who was anointed king over Israel. He ran in there, anointed him in the temple, and then he ran out. The good man, smart man. Because back in those days, you give somebody of authority bad news, you got, you got slayed on the spot. So I was gone. Shortly after that, not far down the road, I don't know how long it was, a month or two or three, she come to me and she looked at me, she goes, I didn't marry him. I said, can you give me an explanation? She said, well, I found out that he was abusive. I didn't know a lot of hidden agendas that he had a lot of things going on. It didn't make her perfect, Pastor, just that the Lord was watching out for her. I'm going to tell you why God was watching out for her. It was a test for her, and God was watching out for her. She told me, she said, I was raised in the assembly of God. And she said, but I quit going to church a long time ago. And I know that I need to get back right with God and need to get back in church. Come on, somebody help me. That's what God does. That's what a test will do. A test will lead people to Jesus. Come on. Every test, the end of that test is going to be Jesus. And there's a new revelation coming to the church. Uh, we're not going to raise up songs about who we are, but who God is. Uh, messages are going to become conformed. Amen. They're not going to be reformed. Uh, they're going to be not deformed. Uh, they're going to conform to the image uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me prophesy. God is getting ready to set pastors uh, and ministers and ministers on fire for God. Uh, they're going to come across to YouTube. But you're not going to find somebody to tickle your ears anymore and pet your secret sins. You're going to find a man or woman of God that's going to tell you how it is. It's going to thrust. It's going to thrust you into a test. But when you come out, you're going to be blessing God. You're going to be loving Jesus more than you ever have. Hmm. Hmm. I got another hour. Hang on. I have never. I have spent more time here praying in tongues than I have anything. I don't know God is at work. I feel like God is in a place to grow our faith. That you're no longer going to live in constant despair, constant depression, constant anxiety. And can I say this by faith? Somebody here and somebody listening is going to get up tomorrow and they're going to say, I'm done with that pill, that pill, and that pill. God, I got to have that kind of faith that Job said, though he slayed me. Yet will I trust him. Church, we have gone so many avenues, so many places, and I'm, on a, I'm all for medication. Amen. I'm, I'm not for it in such a way, though it scares me when Hezekiah, after God had used him mightily, he got sick, and the Bible said he turned to, phys to the physicians and not to God. And he died a leopard in his back chambers, and he wasn't even buried with a proper burying. I want to tell you today, God has a plan for the church. I want to be a part of that plan. If that means you have to go through withdrawals, I'm talking to somebody today, somebody Somebody that's listening, I just feel like I need to say this. Somebody listening, you're going through addictions right now, and God is telling you, if you will just keep looking to me, and you will trust me, yeah, you may pick up that pill to help settle the stomach, settle the mind, settle the spirit from time to time, but something's getting ready to change. I'm going to make that medication no more effective for you, because nobody gets the glory but God. I'm about to turn something around. I'm getting ready to bring deliverance in America today. Those that want it will receive it. Those that want it are going to be laying on the outside looking for them on the inside but there's a revival coming I can't help but prophesy today a little bit I can't help but prophesy can I hear an amen God says I'm about to turn some light on in America today I'm about to raise up a standard that hasn't been raised in a long time you might think I'm crazy but we need more people crazy just like I am <laughs> praise God One Christmas morning at Kerman, 
we had visitors, and I told them, I said, well, we'll see you folks next year. You missed that. Let me define it. I said, you that come here once a year, we'll see you next year. If you're that lazy and unconcerned, we'll see you next year. I had one young lady, <laughs> pastor told me, she said, I'll show that arrogant preacher. I'll come back next Sunday. <laughs> you go, I wish all America would just show us. <laughs> she came back. She brought her husband. Well, they had been together for about 10 years now. I didn't know any of this. I'm, what do I know? I'm just preaching. And they kept coming. And they kept coming. And finally they come to me. Said, we know we need to make things right. So I married him. They gave their hearts to God. He became our youth minister. She became my church clerk. I told you, I've seen, I've seen person after person after person after person. Listen to me, folks. Anna and I have gone through our share of difficulty. Huh, Pastor? We've gone through our trouble. We've gone through our difficulty. So I can tell you from experience, we serve a God that's faithful today to the church of the living God today. He is faithful. Doesn't mean we're not going to hide. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and be made conformable unto his sufferings and unto his death. What he's saying is I want to live, yet not I, but Christ that lives within me and the life that I now live. Hello, the life that I now live. I live in the, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where we want to live, isn't it? It may take some trials for us just to simply say, God, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And you define that trust because James said this very clearly in James chapter 5, faith without works is dead. Don't tell God you're going to trust him and come back to church and don't come back. Don't tell him you'll trust him with your tithing and giving and don't tithe and give. Don't tell God you're going to trust him to witness and not do that. You say, but I, I love God. Yes, he, he, he knows you do. He knows that. He knows you love him with all your heart. You don't want to just, you just don't want to serve him for fire insurance. You want to serve him because it's right. Pastor, we owe him our life. We owe him the breath we breathe. There's a song we used to sing, You are the air that I breathe. We owe him everything. Would you stand this morning, please? Hallelujah. What a service we've had. God is working today. We're going to give an altar call in just a minute. It's just a little before 12. Our kids are not in here yet. Your altar is going to be your key. God allows trials and through the word of God this is the first key when we're taken suddenly into a new trial or test what's going on God you may ask is probably our first response a trial or test on many occasions seldom comes with pre-warning labels they just show up unannounced when they do show up and believe me they will don't linger in the valley of what's going on God too long can I say that again? When your trial shows up, don't linger in the valley of God what's going on too long. The longer you live in that mindset, you'll, you'll start, you'll start attaining. The inner, believe me, the enemy will come in, Pastor, with all doubt and unbelief, and he'll do everything he can. And he'll start, what he'll tell you is this, God can't. You're not only going to say God can, but you're going to say God will. And then as you continue through that process, you're going to begin to say, God has. Faith is not developed when you see the end result of how it may favor you. The trial has served its purpose when the end result gives honor and glory to God. Listen to me. Abraham wrestled with the angel, demanding a blessing from the angel the night before he met his brother Esau he hadn't seen in 20 years, who had vowed when he left his house to kill him one day. On that, at that brook, that brook called J Book, he wrestled with the angel. That was a test. And when he walked away from that, the, Ab Ab the angel told him, he said, your name is no longer Jacob, means supplanter or deceiver, but your name now is Israel. Come on, somebody help me. 
I'm about to say something that's going to transform somebody's life here today because I know that's what the Holy Ghost wants. To. Every time we get together in this building, we should have some process of transformation somewhere. We may not feel it or see it, but we have to believe it. He said, your name is no longer Jacob, but your name will now be Israel. You know what Israel means in Hebrew? Prince with God. Do we have any prince and princesses with God in the house today? Let me see your hand. Come on. Amen. How do you know? Because God has brought me through some stuff. Hallelujah. Ha, 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 ha. God has brought me through some wrestling days. Struggles in the night. I've been praying for my two cousins. One's, uh, uh, he's doing better than the other, and the other is just a plain old heathen. <laughs> my God, have mercy. If he wasn't so big, I'd hit him. But I love him too much. <laughs> he's big. <laughs> he's big. <laughs> and we used to sit in their living room and pray for him, asking him to come to church when we preach over in Vallejo and Fairfield doing revival. He said, nah. My cousin got sick with cancer a few years back, and he calls his cousin here. Brother Freddie, we prayed. He called me the other day. He called me a couple. He called me yesterday, Saturday, and he just starts weeping. He's been diagnosed with possibly lung cancer and a whole lot of other stuff. I said, well, let's just wait and see what God has to say. He said, what's that got to do with trials? I'm about to tell you this. He told me, and he just broke down and started weeping. He said, my, he said, he said, cousin, I woke up this morning in the middle of the night. He said, I am weeping. Brother Freddie, you know how many years I prayed for that spirit to come in his life? He said, I was weeping and weeping and weeping for Cassidy, your daughter. I said, man, I, this stuff that she's had to go through, the difficulties. Well, she's one out of millions. I'm aware of that. We're not isolated with that. But aren't you glad that God knows how to take and touch somebody? What are you saying? He wrestled all night, broken, praying. He said, I've been weeping and praying. Church, I have prayed for years for that kind of response. <laughs> that's what God does. So you're, if your trial leaves you like it did Jacob with a hip that's out of place, well, of course, you just live long enough. You don't have to wrestle. You'll get that anyway. Just a matter of time. <laughs> and if that hip comes out, if you come out of that trial with a little bit of a limp. I noticed Brother John walked. Sister Evelyn, what would you do to John? Don't answer that here. Just a little bit of hip. Something's out of place. In your trial, when you come out, something's not the same. Something's out of order. But maybe that little bit of hip is just to remind you of not how, how bad you are. Come on, somebody help me. But how good God is. Aha, he's good today. So, Lord, I may come out, Pastor, with a, with a limp. I may, I may come out, but I know where I've been. I come out with a new name. I come out with something different, something, something of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a spiritual nature that I couldn't get anywhere else. I didn't come out with a new house, a new car, a new empire. I didn't come out with none of that stuff. All that's going to burn. If he gave it all to you, he'd probably require you to give it away anyway. Somebody help me this morning. It all belongs to God, doesn't it? So... In this trial, here's what's happening. God is working to rebuild. And sometimes that trial breaks down. That foundation that's built on the sand. I, I love to hear about even the, those that have been around a while, the hunger they have for the Word of God. How they've been, Sister Renee, they just they just can't keep from doing just I just like just like you've been doing, just just consuming the Word of God. What's God doing? He's building your faith. You didn't think you'd ever walk up to somebody somewhere and say, do you know the Lord? You're getting ready to do that. Because you have faith in what God can do. The results is up to God. I want you to close your eyes, if you don't mind, just for a minute. Bow your heads today. I'm going to, we're going to have an altar call just for a few minutes. We got time. We got time, don't we, family? Trials are meant to take out and extract what doesn't belong on the throne of our heart. Notice Abraham put what he loved most on the altar. This was the beginning of growth faith in God's word, God's promises. God says today, place it all on the altar. 
In other words, as children of God, you can trust me with yourself, your sin, your plans, your gifts, your talents, your bad attitude, your selfishness, your dreams. And believe me, when I say God's dreams are always far greater than the American dream. God says you can trust me with your children, your grandchildren. Put your money off the altar. Place your job on the altar. Jesus said, whosoever shall lose his life for the kingdom of God's sake shall find it. Put your unforgiveness on the altar. You're hurt from past broken relationships and broken hearts. Notice God never allowed Abraham to sacrifice his son, but he did require him to be willing. God may choose to take away what we give to him, but he can also give it back if he chooses to do so. But what God gives in place of things, substances, or persons is far greater. He gives us an increased faith to trust him more. Family of God, with every eye closed and head bowed, when my, when my time comes to an end, and I'm there doing my service, if Anna chooses to do so or whoever may do so. I want them to be able to say, above any place I've ever been, any message I've ever preached, any prayer I've ever prayed, public or in secret, I want them to be able to say, their dad trusted God. My grandfather trusted God. My dad walked. And Enoch walked with God. Hallelujah. We got some families here walking with God today. Your prayers are making a difference. I want to ask today, this altar call is going to be like this. And those that would like to help me pray, I want you to come up if you would, please. It's going to take just a minute. Some may come to you and pray with you. Please, just, just keep your heart open that the Lord's leading that. We want, to, we want to facilitate that. We're not trying to single anyone out. But I want you to, first of all, first and foremost, have you, if you have not yet, I want to assure you that Jesus is here to receive you into his kingdom and to make things all right in your heart. If you haven't acknowledged him as your Savior today, if you haven't confessed your sins to him and him alone, for he is the only one that can forgive sins. He is the only one. The rest of it is a clearing of conscience, but God wants to change your heart. And only Jesus can do that. If you don't know the Lord, you're welcome to come up today. If you don't want to come alone, Grab somebody and have them come with you. Listen to me. If, when you get desperate for God, you'll do what you need to do. You won't feel embarrassed. You won't feel concerned about what anybody thinks because your eternity <coughs> is at stake as well as your children and your grandchildren and your family, your coworkers, people around you. The second part of this altar call today will be if there's anything that the Lord has been speaking to you about that you've been dealing with, struggling with, wrestling with, talking to him about, going through a trial to, something that you're just not sure how the end result God wants to impart into your heart today a peace that will go beyond your understanding do I have anybody that would like to come up and lead this kind of prayer today we're here to pray with you no matter what it is no matter what your struggle is come on brother Roy please come my brother <laughs> hallelujah come on come on over hallelujah anybody else anybody else come on today hallelujah come on pastor let's pray. hallelujah if you need to come up for prayer today, this is it. This is, I mean, this is, there may be more days, there may not, but you don't have to walk out of here. You walk out of here with peace. You can walk out of here with joy. You can walk out of here with a heart filled with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit today. Father, hallelujah, Lord, today for my brother. Mighty God, for the work that's been taking place in his life. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, shantala my ki alalamo shantala my. Lord, for the work that's been taking place in his heart, God. There is room there. No room for nothing. No room for no one but you, Lord. <laughs> I give it all.